three weeks are you know, about to, are in Yodim of punishment, and we have the three half toilets, which uh, are in that, in that spirit. The first one is Divrei Yirmi Yahu, the second one is Shimu Devar Hashem, and the third one is Chazoin, that's the third Shabbos, next Shabbos. What happened somewhere in some shul in Paris, a friend of mine writes to me after Shabbos, that on Shabbos morning they all forgot that it was a different half Torah, and they read the Pasha half Torah of Pasha's Pinchas. This man who asked me is a Shtikal Talmud Chochem. He asked, What should we do now? So, should we? When, so, I, I you know, corresponded, what, When did they realize the mistake? So, they realized the mistake only by Mincha. So, they took out a Chumash and they said they have Torah by Mincha, perhaps. Poil, here we have uh, this actually is brought in Poskim, this question, and this is. What you have here is the Mishnah Bura, and actually it's a quote from the Mogan Avram, as you see. The Imtor is in Simon Tov Chov Ches. Where would you find the dinim of the Haftoyers? It's interesting. You would have thought it's somewhere in Reish Pei Hei, Reish Pei Vol, which talks about Shabbos morning, davening. No, it's in Tov Chov Ches, the end of the dinim of Rosh Chodesh, because that's all the different changes of the calendar, so uh, which bring about when Pinchas is going to be within the three weeks or before the three weeks. That's in Tov Chov Ches. So he has there about the three haptoides of the of the uh, three weeks. The imtor of hifti b'shabes rishon the parsha b'yoyma. If on the first of the three parshas we made a mistake and the one read the parsha of uh, the haptoide of Pinchos instead of um, dear shu, so the answer is yafti b'shabes habo yir divrei yimayo v'gam shimu. So because divrei yimayo and shimu are both sourced in Sefer Yirmiyo, and they are near one another, the two chapters, one adjacent to the other, one after the other, and therefore, this week, this Shabbos, they will have to do a, a double Haftoira, Yirmi Yirmiyo and Shimu, because Shehem Smuch is because they are next to one another, and the Mishnah Bura quotes here, the Mogna of Rome, B'Shem Tzemach Tzedek, not the Tzemach Tzedek, as in the Rebbe, the Alter Rebbe Zainik, who was the Rebbe in Lubavitch, there was, I mean, sometimes referred to Tzemach Tzedek HaKadwe, there was a Tzemach Tzedek who the Alter Rebbe also brings, who lived probably about 350 years ago, Rebbe Mendel Krochmal, same name, Menachem Mendel, and so he wrote the Shepherd Tzemach Tzedek, and that's what he's quoting from to say both have titles. Now, if we really have the page open in the Mishnah Bura, so we have here the piece before about the union of the 42 journeys. We have in this week's Sedra, the second part of the Sedra, the second in, in Pashas Master, we've got the 42 journeys, and we had in the Hayyim Yom this week, that when Matis and Masi are separate, which is irrelevant this year. So then when it comes to Kriya Satoyer on Shabbos afternoon and at Monday and Thursday, so the third Aliyah, if I'm not mistaken, so anyway, when we read all the 42 Masoys, whereas in most shuls and most Sidurim, they will say you just read a small amount. Now, there is this Sefer Tzor Hamur, which is a early one of the Rishonim, he says not to interrupt. The, the 42 journeys in Pashas Masse, because they correspond to the Shem Mab, as we've discussed not too long ago, and then Ano Bechoya corresponds to the Shem Membez of 42, which is the idea of whatever it is, elevating. It doesn't matter, Pikabola, you don't interrupt the middle of the Membez. So most Minhogim will say, okay, Shabbos morning, we won't interrupt the middle of the Membez Masoys. When it comes to uh, Mondays and Thursdays and people rushing off to work, etc., or on Shabbos afternoon, or the Rashi for Shalosh Shudas, whatever it may be. So the most popular minig is not to do the, four, the 42 journeys on the shorter reading of um, Shabbos afternoon, Monday and Thursday. And here Lubavitch is unique in this, Kimat. Uh, actually, it's also, I saw also the Munkacher, Rob, in the Dark Echayim Rasholim, he mentioned he also had this minig that to do all 42 journeys, despite that uh, the... Uh, it's a shorter reading. And then I found something interesting. We know that the minimum, we've gone through this perhaps recently, the minimum shear of a, of a short reading has to be 10 psukim. But the minig is that the Mondays and Thursdays you read till Shani. That's the standard minig. That's how the Shari Ephraim writes that on Mondays and Thursdays you go till Shani. And so usually it's more than 10 psukim. All right, so then take a parcha chumash, a parcha's and you'll see that 
Shani is out of the 42 Masoids, so corresponding to that minute, so you have to, you know, yeah, you, you, then our minute fits to the minute Goilom that you read until the end of, till, till Shani of that week's end. So, all right, so uh, for Mondays and Thursdays, and that's clear, you have to factor in another three minutes for the Masoids to be read. Let's go on to the next question. All right, here I got a question. Someone here in London listens to a shear, perhaps in French, perhaps it's from Eretz Israel, and that's what I, I gathered. And the Magad Shear had said that when you're Mafrish Kala, you have to do it immediately. As soon as you've made the dough, you should be separating the Kala and not wait until the dough has risen and all that. So I asked, you know, I, I'm, I'm, my, my, what I do in the kitchen is basically eating, also tasting, but uh, I don't usually, usually do the cooking. So I asked what's, the, what's usually in the say do. So my wife says that sometimes she's concerned that you put in the yeast, etc. it might not rise. So wait till it rises. But let's, let's look at the halacha. So the first thing we have on the top right is a mishnah. It's a mishnah in chala, paid at gimel. As soon as she's added the water, she should separate chala. There's two What that means is provided the water and flour, there's already fire, the measure of uh, the adequate amount of uh, flour is already mixed in into the water. So then you can really take chala. That's if you say shiyahe. If you say shaloyahe means that when you, we, what we've said here is as soon as you've mixed the flour, you should take chala. But if there's still another in, it's a large bowl. And besides what has become dough, there's still more flour which is loose, which hasn't been mixed into the dough. So it's too early because you have to take chala from that flour also. Either way, it does say in the Mishnah that as soon as you put in the water, and she's combined early beginnings of the dough before the dough has risen. So then Magba Skalos. So when I was on the phone with this uh, lady, I thought it was because of the idea of Zrizin Magdim and Mitzvah. You should do a mitzvah as, as, as uh, early as possible. But then I looked up and it turns out we don't have Gemara on Gemara on Chala, but there is your Shalmi. And the reason for the ha rush is because of Tumavatar. The worry is that you're going to in those times, you set aside a piece of khala and then you give it to the coin and the coin would eat it. Now, what would happen if you are mixing the khala and then you're going to leave it around? The longer you leave it unattended, the more likely there could be a mishap that someone thumping of tumor will touch it. And therefore, in those times when tumor vatara was applicable, then you would do it as soon as possible. So that's what the Mishnah is talking about. There's a, a rush to take khala is talking when the dinim of Tumma Vatara of Anoyeg and you give the piece of khala to the coin. Therefore, that makes it not so... Uh, not, so nowadays, which unfortunately we don't have that a gift to the coin, therefore it's not such a rush. Then, there's another issue here. You're making a dough and some of the flour is not mixed in. Now that flour which is not mixed in is not part of the Hafrosh's khala, so to speak. So... Now on the bottom left, here is a quote from the Bartanura, who's commenting on that Mishnah. And he says that when you have a dough, which is part dough and part flour, and you take challah early, you should have in mind the flour also, which is going to be, in other words, it's now five past three. And at ten past three, at five past three, this flour, which is not part of the dough. At ten past three, three it will be part of the dough. When I take the piece of chala at five past three, I have in mind for the chala, for the flower, which will join also at ten past three. That's how a person should educate the, the people, the women who are doing the baking. If they are going to be mafrish chala, as soon as they've made the dough, before they bake it, be shape the loaves, they should say, I'm having in mind also the flour which will be added later. Let's now go to the right. We have here the commentary of Rebekah Ege. 
as we know, he was a contemporary of the Mittler Rebbe, of the Alter Rebbe, um, and he has got these short uh, his comments on the side of the uh, Mishnayas, many of them just quotes from earlier Svarim, and he writes the following. So he's commenting, if that's, you see that little um, circle, that symbol is to tell you, look at the Rebbe Kiva Eger. So he writes the following. What's, why should she um, what's the concern with this? Uh, with, uh, so he says, mm-hmm. If you're making loaves, yeah? You, you, when you're making chalas, you, you also you put some fresh flour on the table. As you're rolling the, the dough, you take more flour. So you've got the flour which you mix in directly with the water in the mixing bowl. But then as you're shaping, you put more flour on the table, and you uh, you're helping you that's helping you shape the loaves. It's unlikely that you'll have you know um, three key, three on whatever three pounds or whatever of flour mixed into one color. Of course not. As you you're not going to mix in so much flour whilst you're shaping. But keeping the bain kula ikor But let's say you're doing a large batch. I'm told it's unlikely, but let's say you're doing a very large batch, and it's possible that you actually use three uh, pounds of flour with all of those loaves. Now, if you had taken khala earlier, so then the these three pounds of flour haven't been taken khala from. Now you put them into the oven, then they're going to be come as one because they're all in the one, one oven. And if let's say you took challah, threw it straight into the fire, and now you've got here um, all of this flour which was now made into dough, and challah hasn't been taken. So that's what he's saying here. You should have in mind, you should have in mind the the flour which will be mixed in. One last point, and here we have. I looked around. I've got one of these specialists for him on challah. And he gives a reference to the Kafa Chaim and Din Eresh Ben Beis, Arab Shabbos, who refers to the Arizal. And this is from the Sefer Shah HaMitzvahs of the Arizal. Now, I first I got mixed up. I first looked up Tame HaMitzvahs of the Arizal, and I couldn't find the point. So then I looked up in Shah HaMitzvahs. The Tim is similar, but the Shah HaMitzvahs is more, uh, more detailed here. This is in Shah HaMitzvahs in Parashat Shlach. That's where the Mitzvah of Chal is written. In the Torah, so the Arizal is quoted here to say, Gam so is very unusual. You would have expected it's, in, it's all Kabbalah, but here it's, it's pretty much, you know, a uh, balabatisha halocha. When you kash a goisim oid, says the Arizal, if you're making a very soft dough, and as you are on the rolling board, you're adding more flour. Why do you add flour, as, add flour as you're rolling the dough? That it shouldn't stick to your hands, it shouldn't stick to the, to the board. When you are mafresh chala, before, before making it, you should have in mind the flour which will be added later, which you will do so you shouldn't get stuck. And it gives reference to the Ran Kedushin. And then he writes, yeah, He says it's actually an advantage, actually, to only separate the challah after you've shaped the loaves. And then to burn the challah, because if you had separated the challah and burned it too early, it doesn't help for the camera. So what we're seeing here, to summarize, is quite confusing. We have here in the Zman HaMishnah, when Tum Vitara is applicable, as soon as possible, because of worry of Tum Vitara. Then we have doing it too early, and you might have a chashash of a lot of flour being mixed in, would, would be a question, and therefore it would be better to ash take the challah after shaping the loaves. Lepoil, that's not the minig either. As far as I understand, the women will wait till the dough rises, and then they will separate the uh, challah before they shape the loaves. So it seems to be neither here nor there. Um, so, all right, this I just mentioned before, the chashash, if you're worried that the dough won't work out, 
So you take it once the dough is made. But in any event, if you are going to take the dough before, separate the dough before you shape the chalice, so then you should have in mind that it should also include any flour which will be added later. Let me add one more point whilst we're on the topic of chala. I had my uh, weekly slot in the base on uh, 140 Stamford Hill this morning and a lady called up and she asked that she's made several sponge cakes. Now each sponge cake he used you don't use a sheer challah in a sponge cake. You use a one for one pound or whatever it may be. You don't use three pounds in one sponge cake. But she made several sponge cakes and then she put them all into one box. Now in the one box, there's more than a sheer challah. And there's the concept of syrup salt, that the basket, they're all in one basket, makes them all into a one sheer challah. Now actually, the late Rav Falk, in his Sefer Marzel Yohu, he has a long discussion about the freezer. When you've made lots of small cakes, which are less than a shia challah, then you put them all into a freezer, because it's always, we just now saw about the oven combining. He talks about the freezer, which is like one big keili. I don't remember his, his conclusion over there. Lepoil, what did I tell this lady? I told her it's a good point, very nice shaila. I told her to be mafrish a piece, but without a bracha. The reason being that the Tzimach Tzedek has got a tshuva in, in Yeridea, and he says, is malamed schus on the fact that people don't take challah from a dough, well, from a lekech. And he has a very interesting mahalach. What's the bracha, bracha on lekech? We know the bracha is mezonis. But really, the svara would have been a lekech, like a, what's the bracha on, on a chocolate brownie? Come on. A chocolate brownie is a piece of sugar. It's got a bit of flour in it. But the halacha says mezonis becomes a balabos. Mezoinus dominates, so therefore the chop rock and the chocolate brownie is mezoinus. But he says, as far as chal is concerned, I'm going to look at it more as a sweet rather than as a, as a pastry. And that's his, basically his limud's chus, why the minig is that in people don't take challah from lekker, from, from a honey cake. So that on that basis, I mean, I didn't ask the woman for the recipe and how much sugar she puts in all her sponge cakes, but let's say there is a lot of sugar, so then we have the we have reason to say it may not be chayv bechala. As I told her, she should take a piece of the of a cake, put it aside, put it together when you burn it, whatever. But she can say haris bechala, but she shouldn't have a bracha because of a bracha from two separate people. Shiles, this fellow, he just um, he just uh, how do you say um, exchange contract? No, not exchange. He just completed on this house. This is somewhere in uh, north of England. And there's an app, it's a pear tree. You can see on the left, it's a pear tree. And you see it's built, it's right near the house. And so uh, if he wants to extend the house, well, it's going to be in the way. So the, the, there's this coming up, this question again and again. Are you allowed to, to cut it down? We have a problem. So here we have a halacha, it's from Alter Rebbe Shikonaru, in Choshen Mishpit, in the Hichos of Shmir Sefer, Gub and Efesh Baltashchis. So let's read the halacha inside. Oh, we're running very, I didn't realize we're running very late in time. Okay, a, a barren tree, you're allowed to chop down, even if you don't need it. A, an old fruit tree, which is, which is old and is only producing very little fruit, you're allowed to chop it down. Um, then he says, But there is an element of sakona, of danger. Um, which could be um, in kind of invited because of chopping down a fruit tree. So we have here a worry about this. So what I said to the uh, owner of this house, the pity he didn't tell, uh, ask me the Shaila before you exchange contracts, before you complete it. But no, that's not the question. But then, huh? The question is to replant it. Oh, so now, oh, so then I say, then he asks, what about replanting? So replanting in itself would be okay. That's most, most Poskim say replanting is not a problem. Rav Vosner says that from his experience, most replantings are not successful. Take such a tree and re, you, sometimes it's so big that replanting is not practical. That's why I put the picture here. Dafke hits quite a small tree, relatively. And so replanting is a possibility. So replant, then they ask, do they have to replant in his land? It could be plant somewhere else. So replanting, according to most poskim, is okay. 
but then I'm told it's not really eff effective. And therefore we go back to the other suggestion of selling it to an Aina Yehudi, and then he does with it as he sees fit. Of course, you tell him exactly what he should see fit. But uh, that, that's the eight. So we, whenever you, we wouldn't rely on selling to a goy with, uh, without another element, especially because of the attendant sakana. But here, because the, there is another svar, the svar is that the replanting would work. So just to be, to be covered, ask a, a, sell it to a goy before and, and tell him to replant it.
um, with the smelling as well as with the bracha. But uh, if they don't, if no one has a sense of smell, so you don't say the bracha, that's all.